Uh, you're with me, Riza Zokapi, and this is Business Awani. And we'll be talking to Dr. Sharon Musani of Kazana Research Institute on their latest um, report on the housing affordability in Malaysia. Now, recently, Kazana re uh, released a report or research on the housing affordability in Malaysia, which concluded that most or uh, all or a lot of the houses in Malaysia are quite unaffordable or severely unaffordable, with the exception of Malacca. And I would like to read a passage from this um, research, um, the concluding remarks. Um, of this research which um, stated that the trends in Malaysia suggest that both the bottom 40% and the middle 40% of household income earners are likely to end up in some form of social housing if the relevant interventions are not made urgently. So I think that is quite um, an urgent uh, plea to look at the housing affordability in Malaysia. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharon, for joining us. I think we want to look at first um, housing affordability in Malaysia, um, where we are and what we can learn from others. And I think a lot of discussions on housing affordability are usually led by uh, property developers. Um, they are bigger, they are more collected and they are more united in that sense. And um, demands of homeowners and home buyers are usually sidelined or not loud enough in that sense. Um, what do we do or what do we need uh, to create policies that are more geared towards homeowners or home buyers moving forward? Thank you, and, and thank you for having me on, 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 on this show. Um, yes, our report was on hu housing affordability, mm -hmm. and it's important that we call it affordability, not house prices, mm -hmm. because um, uh, affordability isn't just the house price, but it's the, it's the ratio of the house price to, to people's income. And, um, and you're right, the debate at the moment um, is, is a difficult one because getting information on what's really happening is, is, is always hard. And one of the things we tried to do in this book is first of all to set up where, where are we today? I mean, is, really, is housing really that unaf unaffordable? And um, so you mentioned just now concepts of you know, seriously unaffordable, moderately unaffordable, etc. So there's a kind of global definition of what constitutes affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And that is three times median income, three times annual median income. So a housing market is deemed affordable if the median house price, that's the middle house price, is about three times the median household income. So it's me median being again the, the halfway mark of, of households. So in, in Malaysia um, as a whole, in the whole country, it's more than um, more than four times, which makes it um, unaffordable mm -hmm. by, by, by any stretch. Um, so th that really is, is what our report starts to look at. And, and you're right. And after that, we, we then analyse why prices are high and then we have some policy recommendations. Mm -hmm. But what about um, home owners or home buyers mm. um, creating policies geared more towards them? What are the steps or what, are, what do we need to create more policies um, looking at uh, plights of the home owners and home buyers? Right. So. What we looked at, and we, you know, having decided, having found that houses are unaffordable in many mm -hmm. parts of the country, and again, I have to stress this, right? It's not everywhere that houses are unaffordable because we have different housing markets. You've got a housing market in Kuala Lumpur, which is, you know, uh, very dense, uh, very urbanised, and you have a housing market in, in less uh, urbanised uh, states of Malaysia. So, um, but looking at the problem areas, particularly Kuala Lumpur and Penang, um, something has to be done because uh, house prices there are well over five times. Um, median income, mm -hmm. which is which is by any, which, which is high, but of course not as high as some some other countries. I mean, Hong Kong has got a terrible uh, ratio, it's 17 times. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to wait till we get to 17 times before we do anything about it. Um, so the kind of policies we're looking at is uh, first of all finding out what's causing it, and mm -hmm. you know, standard economics says there's demand um, the supply well. and the supply, right? So if demand rises, uh, prices tend to rise. But if you make supply elastic, uh, in other words, that a responsive supply, then prices won't rise that much. Mm -hmm. If supply is inelastic, um, or, in, or in this case vertical, um, I, that means you know, uh, price uh, volume, you don't build more houses as a response, then prices will shoot up. So we think that the long-term structural way to solve this problem is to make housing supply more elastic. In other words, having a more responsive housing sector. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about housing supply in mm. the next um, few sure. segments that sure. we have. But let's look at um, countries with the highest percentage of home ownership. We have first Romania, 95% uh, Lithuania, 92% mm. Singapore, and 90%, something, uh, or, or a kind 
country that maybe we can relate to or we can learn from, like China 90%. How did they achieve this? And what can we learn from maybe Singapore and China in terms of managing or providing um, um, uh, uh, home ownership for uh, people of that particular country? Well, actually, housing ownership in Malaysia is quite high. Mm. I a quote from, from our report. It's well over, it's about 70%, which is, which is you know, um, it's about 72.5%, um, which is, which is you know, very good. I mean, uh, again, just a quote from here. Um, US, only 66% on their houses. But house ownership is, is a difficult thing to measure in Malaysia because if you look at the numbers from the Department of Statistics, we have over 7 million houses um, um, in Malaysia. According to NAPIC, which is a national uh, property information centre, uh, there are only about 4 million or so houses. So it's a 3 million gap. And the reason there's a 3 million gap is that the houses which are counted by NAPIC or the National Property Information Centre are formal houses. That means houses built in urban areas where you're in development order, you have circuit CF and, and etc. Mm -hmm. But you know, a lot of people in Malaysia don't live in urban areas. They live in the, uh, in, in, in the rural areas, the countryside. And in the countryside, you don't need the same kind of formality in your housing. So it's very difficult to measure you know, um, um, uh, the kind of idea of housing ownership. But Nevertheless, if you look at um, everywhere, we reckon, uh, according to the Department of Statistics, you know, st you know, well over seventy percent of Malaysians own their house. So that's a that's a reasonable number. Mm -hmm. And do you think, because of the lack of data, that there is this um, pressure to increase um, home prices because of that? It's not so much the lack of data, uh, which there is. Mm -hmm. um, there is a lack of data, but it's this idea that you know, supply doesn't move fast enough. Mm -hmm. When people want more houses, um, instead of there being more houses being built, uh, not enough houses are being built. And because not enough houses are being built fast enough, then the price of every house gets you know, pushed up. Mm -hmm. Let's take a mm -hmm. short break. When we come back, let's talk about how we can maybe increase supply of houses and also manage the demand uh, moving forward. Let's take a short break. When we come back, we'll talk to Dato' Sharum Mazani on uh, housing affordability in Malaysia. With me is Dato Sharu Mozani of Kazana Research Institute discussing housing affordability in Malaysia based on Kazana Research Institute's um, latest uh, report. So let's talk about the um, supply side um, of um, the houses in Malaysia because you mentioned that if we manage the supply side, we might be able to reduce um, pressure to house prices in Malaysia. How do we do that? Because I think right now, um, based on your report, um, there is a part where um, it states there that um, the property developers churn out properties which are priced um, maybe higher than the demand price in that sense. Is this something that we should look at seriously moving forward? Yes, um, we should look at, 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 at supply. Now, if you look at some of the more unaffordable housing markets, uh, Kuala Lumpur, for example, and you know, we, we, we have a chart in our book which shows the kind of property launches made in 2014. And most of them are at the high end, 500,000 and above and a million and above. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, there is a market for those houses. Um, but unfortunately, um, the vast majority of the population um, cannot afford those houses. So when we say we want a responsive housing sector, we would like to see supply of houses at at, um, at, you know, at all price points. Mm -hmm. and, and that does happen. So if you look at Malacca, which has uh, actually a very affordable housing sector, uh, and you look at the property launches in Malacca, they were all at, at, at different price points, mm -hmm. which meant that you know, different you know, people could, um, could afford those houses. Um, but getting back to what you said earlier about how to make the supply more responsive, um, really it looks at quite structural changes in the way we, uh, the housing industry is, is, is run. Mm -hmm. Um, to give you an example, the way we run our construction industry is very much rooted in uh, the colonial um, way of, of running, a uh, running a housing industry. So you have, you, know, you have architects, you have engineers, you have quantity surveyors, and you have contractors, etc., etc., etc. Most other countries have moved away from that. Um, what they try to do is to have everybody work together mm -hmm. and, and, and come up with um, far more um, 
efficient. Efficient designs, that's mm -hmm. right, efficient designs. So we give an example of the Philippines in, in, in our report. It's a company which we studied called 8990 Holdings. Mm -hmm. um, now that's a remarkable company because they can build a house in two weeks. Oh. In two weeks, right? And um, they do this because they've reorganized the way in which they build houses. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people talk, have talked about industrial built system or prefabricated mm -hmm. houses or pre prefabrication. And, and in a sense, that's what they're doing in the Philippines. But they're doing it in a Philippines way. So it's not like you have to import a very expensive um, a patented system from another country, mm -hmm. but you develop something which is suitable for, for our country. But if you imagine um, Lego blocks, right? If we could design our houses around Lego blocks, I mean, I'm using Lego blocks not metaphorically, right? <laughs> no, not for real. I'm not saying we really should use Lego blocks, but imagine we could break everything down into Lego blocks mm -hmm. and we design our houses. So when an architect designs a house or a developer designs a house or anybody comes up with a house, he designs the house on the basis that it must be built using those Lego blocks. Mm -hmm. Then if we have all those Lego blocks around the way and people get efficient in, 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 in using those Lego blocks, then we could have houses built um, much faster. Have you spoken to any property developers? We have, we have, we have. And, and What's the response that you got so far? We're, we're very pleased because, um, for example, in, in Singapore, mm -hmm. um, they use prefabrication or industrial built systems um, quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And the way they've done it in Singapore is the government says that, you know, keeps raising the bar in terms of um, buildability of the house. So, you know, every year the government says you must do more and more uh, industrial built systems. So many Malaysian developers have experience at, of, of that in Singapore and they're, they're all for it because there is something quite, you know, wasteful, or, or I shouldn't say wasteful, but um, there's a lot of efficient, efficiency gains which could be made in our housing sector. Mm -hmm. And we need to do that. We need to do that because if we don't, Right. We just have this, this problem of demand rising and rising and rising and supply not, not catching up with and it. You've mentioned that one of the cause of the rising prices um, mm. in the um, research is the fact that we, our population is continuously That's rising right. as you That's mentioned right. just now. That's right. And um, how soon can we maybe look at um, cutting the uh, building process um, shorter and shorter and shorter so that we can actually meet the demand of the rising population in Malaysia. Can we look at um, using the technologies that you've mentioned as soon as next year or the year after? The technologies exist. Mm -hmm. um, CIBD um, has been promoting this, um, promoting this for, for a while but I think we've reached a point where it becomes very important mm -hmm. that, that we do something. Um, and, 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 and reform, uh, make the structural changes. Um, getting back to your point about the rising population, that is true. One, one big factor is rising population. More, more people requires more houses. The second factor is urbanization. People are moving from the countryside, from rural areas to, to the town areas, so you need to build houses for them in the town areas. The third one is the size of households. Now in 1970, and the average household had five and a half people. Mm -hmm. So that means for every 1,000 people, you probably need about 180 plus houses. Mm -hmm. By 2020, the, the size of households will shrink. There will only, need four, there'll only be four people per, house, per household. So for every 1,000 people, you need 250 houses. Mm -hmm. So we have a double whammy here. Population is growing, and we're requiring more houses to, 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 uh, for any given number of uh, people. Before we take a short break, I'm mm. just going to ask this question whether this issue of affordable housing, um, a home ownership, um, is only exclusive to Malaysia or other, we see in other Southeast Asian countries as well, looking at how we have a bigger um, growing middle class and growing population within this particular region. Is this something that we should look um, forward to in the future? Housing affordability is, is an issue, I think, globally. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, there, there, there are many global conferences about it. And if you read the uh, um, domestic or international press, you can find other countries are, are, are facing the same problem. Mm -hmm. and, um, but it is something we have to do it. But on, on the plus side, though, the housing industry is a very big industry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it employs a lot of people. It, it contributes a lot to GDP. So if we can make that more efficient, you know, we are. You know, it has many positive economic benefits. What we shouldn't do is look at affordable housing as a social welfare issue. Mm -hmm. you know, it shouldn't be a, a, a question of government subsidy and more subsidy and more subsidy. Um, because you know, we can't possibly subsidize the housing needs of 80% of the population. We will always need to look after the, the, the people who are, uh, who are the least well off, who can never be able to afford a house. But uh, for the, the, the majority of the population, we must find a market solution 
where you know uh, where houses are built uh, uh, in a way at, at a price point which which enough people can afford. So instead of looking at um, giving. In, in this case, monetary uh, um, subsidies. Mm. We should look at the policies, the underlying policies um, moving forward to look at or to address housing affordability issues in Malaysia. That's right. Mm. A, a change in the a structural change in the in, in, in the system, mm. and um, but we have to do it. We have to do something. Mm. Right? We have to do something. And 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 the solution cannot be government giving money to people to buy houses. Okay, let's take another short break. When we mm. come back, let's talk about future trends because mm. I think um, we have to move forward and whether when we move forward, the traditional definition of a house will still apply because I think right now we're still looking at 20 by 70, landed property, three bedrooms minimum. So do we still need to look at that in the future or should we start changing um, and, and look at um, um, creating affordability through technology and maybe smaller uh, living spaces? Let's uh, talk about that in a while. Sharon Mazani of Kazana Research Institute on housing affordability in Malaysia. Third part will discuss about um, understanding future needs and creating a sustainable solution moving forward. So let's talk about um, the generation that we are looking at right now, future home owners or future home buyers. We're looking at a generation that can get, um, they, they don't have to buy a car, they can just you know, get transportation uh, from the public transportation, they can get um, from Uber, they can even rent handbags um, online. Um, they are service providers that do that is home ownership for everyone in the future uh, or is this a fact that was created to fulfill a traditional need of security as you move forward that's an excellent question and in terms of what the future brings uh, it's, it's hard to it's hard to predict but let me just perhaps just take a little bit step back and and the traditional view of housing is goes something like this right um, is that I, I work I save my money, I buy a house mm -hmm. so that when I retire and I have less money coming in, at the very least I have a roof over my head. Mm -hmm. And um, that is a very understandable uh, sentiment for, for most people because you know, what do you do when, when you retire and you have no more money coming in? Mm -hmm. You need a roof over your head. Um, and the idea that if you say people should rent all the time, then when I retire, and I have no more money coming in, how can I pay the rent? Mm -hmm. So again, there's this idea of owning a house as a security for the future. You could make the case um, that, that maybe that a house is not the best investment for the future. Mm -hmm. You could make the case that maybe I should put it in a unit trust mm -hmm. or Amana Saham or some other diversified uh, uh, means of investing. So rather than investing in, in a house for my retirement, I should maybe invest in mutual funds or, or something mm -hmm. like that and then just pay rent uh, in the meantime um, we are we are looking at looking at this to see uh, to see what it looks like but for the vast majority of people the the, the security of owning the the, the, the place you live um, is is still a very important uh, very very important concern but I agree in the future uh, uh, people who have grown up um, more comfortable with investing, more comfortable with the choices which, you know, in internet banking and, 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 and the choices you get now online in terms of investments, uh, may have a totally different view about it. And maybe we could get to a, to a, to a situation where people save for their future, mm. not through buying a house. Okay. But some other way. You make me feel very relieved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I, also, looking at um, the trend um, mm. of uh, buying property or buying houses mm. as an investment, I'm sure that has also an effect on the housing affordability or house prices in Malaysia. What do you um, have to say about that? Well, we, we have a very technical appendix to here. Uh -huh. I mean, we, we try to make this accessible to the uh, to the non-economists, but there's some things where you are quite heavy-duty economics. So we have an appendix at the end where we run through economic theory on the effect of speculation on, mm -hmm. on housing prices. And there seems to be clear, well, there seems to be both from a theoretical point of view and from a kind of uh, data point of view that um, speculators, by speculators I mean someone who buys a house with no intention 
intention to live in it mm -hmm. or no intention to keep it for very long um, can drive up prices which is why one of our recommendations in here is that if we were to make the structural changes and come up with you know cheaper houses which come up quickly we should in the early years have a moratorium in other words if someone you know, in return for getting a cheap, uh, a more affordable house, um, the buyer says, I, I won't sell it for five years. Mm -hmm. And the reason we're doing that is so that people don't buy it to then sell it again at, at a high price, which would defeat the purpose of having it. But, you know, after a while, we won't need this moratorium because if enough houses come up uh, at a low price, then we won't have to keep a moratorium. And there's no point speculating if... You know, I, I speculate by buying a house today, hoping to have sell it for a higher price tomorrow because there are not enough houses. But if there's a steady supply of new houses coming out, um, then speculation, at least at that market level, um, um, will cease. Okay, I have some pictures I want to share with mm. you. Um, I printed this off the internet and I want to share these pictures with you. Um, maybe these are future um, houses or homes that we can consider because these um, houses are not the 20 by 70 um, traditional definition of houses that we have in Malaysia um, that we're looking at uh, year after year. Because I think as the population grows, and you mentioned yourself, that um, the size of household are getting smaller and smaller. That's right. That's right. Can we look at this as an alternative to the traditional definition of house? Uh, we create our own definition of housing mm. or houses mm. um, moving forward. Can we at least look at it? Because I think we've been discussing future cities and creating um, more technology-driven um, innovation for living. No, uh, uh, yes, yes. Because I think um, in, a, in, an ideal city, in an ideal world, uh, you know, if you want, there'll be multiple choices available. You know, given a certain budget, you can you can find the type of living living accommodation you want. And and you're right in terms of you know young people who who are living alone. They're, they're, we have a rising number of single member households. In other words, people living alone. So yeah, I mean, the, 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 a house suitable or a, a dwelling suitable for someone living alone and someone with um, children is, is 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 different. And you can't expect there to be just one product for for everyone. Yes, and I think we 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 will we will have a variety of of housing products but, and, and the examples you've shown um, again it will, it, 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 it will depend in in some places where there is sufficient land um, we, we could be able to house this like this but in some places we may have no choice but to just build upwards in which case people will still live in apartments and uh, in, in, in apartments but um, in a well-functioning housing market um, that choice should be available at different price points. And what future trends should be, or should we prepare for, uh, be prepared for, uh, moving forward um, in terms of home ownership and in terms of uh, pro property developers? What trends should we be prepared for? Well, what we hope is that um, we will have a more responsive. Um, housing market where where houses can be built more efficiently at, at a lower cost and 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 faster. Um, with that responsive housing market, we hope therefore that that you know overall uh, there will be affordable housing and at, at different price points. And I have to uh, stress this different price points uh, because you know, um, we will talk about the median income, but you know there's a whole range. There's some people who earn less than the median income, and some people earn more than the median income. So we should have you know a housing market which caters to all those needs, a bit like the car market. Mm -hmm. You know you can buy. Uh, a, 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 a small car at a lower price or a very big car uh, at a very high price or a very small car, sports car at a very, very high price, um, depending on, on, on what your needs are and, and what your income is. So it'd be, I, the, the ideal situation would be to have a housing market like that. Thank you very much, Dr. Shah Ramzani. Pleasure. Thank Pleasure. you very much um, Thank you. for discussing uh, housing affordability in Malaysia. And we look forward to more um, reports from Khazanah Research Institute. Thank you very much. There was Dr. Shah Ramzani of Khazanah Research Institute discussing housing affordability in Malaysia. And this is Riza Sokapli. Thank you very much for joining us for the, for the past half an hour. Um, salam hormat. <laughs>